so good evening and thank you all so much for joining us tonight for Strange New England with Tom D'Agostino. We're joined by paranormal investigator and author Tom D'Agostino for his popular presentation. New England's history is full of strange and mysterious figures. We're going to meet some of these incredible people whose lives ranged from the outlandish to out of this world. Uh, Wilmington's Don Dr. France Hiller, uh, the casket lady, will be among those highlighted Providing the truth uh, is indeed, uh, proving, excuse me, the truth is indeed stranger than fiction. So Tom is the author of A Guide to Haunted New England and nearly a dozen other paranormal history books. Uh, he's also the co-founder of Paranormal United Research Society and has extensively studied and investigated paranormal accounts for over 30 years. And I again want to thank the libraries in Boxford, Clinton, Drake at Littleton, Lowell, Merrimack, Newberry, and Norwood for partnering with Tewksbury tonight. Uh, so all uh, 90 of us or so that's here virtually, and I'm sure lots more that will watch on demand. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Tom for joining us here tonight. And Tom, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, it, it is quite an honor to be here, actually, and presenting this for everyone. Uh, thank you for all for tuning in. Anyway, yeah, this is going to be New England's strangest people throughout history. And New England actually has had a lot of different uh, people history. Uh, it's like one of the biggest in the whole country. And the peculiar characters just keep flowing. Uh, I wanted to um start with this one right in york maine reverend moody reverend moody was uh actually joseph moody was born in york maine in 1700 he died in 1753 he was the second minister of the church of york and uh during the latter part of his life a strange thing happened he began wearing a black veil over his face just out of nowhere. Now he was also a uh, justice of the peace and uh, you know served a bunch of town offices, but all of a sudden he started doing his sermons wearing this black veil. Uh, he began to take night walks and he began to hide during the day except for his services and his events. In fact, people began to uh, actually only call on him for funerals because during the more, uh, I guess, uh, you know, happier events, he would be sitting there with his black veil Many thought he had suffered some sort of mental and physical breakdown when his wife and infant daughter died. Uh, and it was only during that period that he wore a white handkerchief. Then he became, uh, you know, then he turned it to black. Now, uh, preaching didn't really suit him so much as he um, just was following in his father's footsteps. However, what happened was this. The, he wore this handkerchief for many years, and on his deathbed, he finally confessed to why he wore it. When he was a child, according to the stories, one people thought it was from a mental breakdown, but another, when he was a child, he and his best friend were out hunting, and he accidentally shot and killed his best friend. Now, to allay any suspicion or guilt on him, he blamed it on an Indian attack. And later on in life, his best friend began appearing in front of him all the time, telling him he needed to confess his deed. Uh, he put the veil over his face for two reasons. One, so he would not see the ghost of his best friend all the time. And two, he thought his congregation should not have to look upon the face of a sinner. When he died, the veil of his soul was lifted, but he was buried with the veil, um, it to uh, in uh, a little small cemetery. He's not in the York Cemetery. He's buried in a little little teeny cemetery down the road. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne actually wrote a story based on him called The Minister's Black Veil, which is quite amazing. The Eddy family out of Chittenden, Vermont. Chittenden, during the time of their lives, became what was called the spirit capital of the universe. Zephaniah Eddy married Julia McCombs of Vermont. Her family had a high, heavy lineage of psychic and medium uh, in their family. They had 11 known children. Believe it or not, all of the 11 children were born with psychic powers. Many of them didn't use them to some extent, but two of them did. In fact, Horatio and William Eddy um, was 
one of the, the two of the most powerful ones. Uh, as many, many times they'd look out in the field and they'd see Horatio and William playing and all of a sudden these other children would just appear out of nowhere playing with them. They would walk out to the field, the mother and father and the children would disappear. The kids could not attend school because things were constantly flying around uh, while they were in school. And in fact, when they got a little older, uh, the father actually shipped the two brothers and Mary, the sister, out around the country to make money at uh, with their powers. They were put through all kinds of tortures and tests to prove that they were really psychic. Miranda, which is one of the sisters, was actually the most gifted. She began to see her brothers, James and Francis, who had already passed away. Francis was a Civil War soldier. He caught a uh, very bad flu and it turned into running consumption and he died. Before he died, two uh, people, Civil War soldiers came to the door with a coffin, brought the coffin in and laid it on the floor. When they went to get a candle, the soldiers in the coffin were gone. Uh, when Francis died, he had the exact date he would die. He wrote it down in a Bible and he did. They ordered a coffin from Rutland, which was just a few miles away. When the coffin came, the two soldiers that delivered it were the exact soldiers they had seen six months before, and the coffin was the exact same coffin. Miranda was being, in her last days of sickness, was being uh, actually tended to by a Mrs. Beard. When Mrs. Beard was holding her, Miranda died. She died and she died stiff, but a few, like a minute or so after she died, she lifted her arm and closed her own eyes. It was very unbelievable. Um, Mrs. Eddy uh, actually comforted Miranda before her death and also, and uh, they, when the brothers and returned to Chittenden after these kind of long, you know, sellout think crowds, uh, they began doing seances with their sister Mary, a man named Henry Steele Alcott, a, uh, writer for New York papers and went and visited them for 10 weeks and six days a week they put on shows in their house where the uh, William Eddy would come out of this teeny little closet and sit in the room you see in the lower left where people would sit and in that teeny little closet which you see at the end of that picture in the lower lower right hand side they would um, be over they had over 40 different figures come out of this closet from a 4'11 Indian to a six foot tall man to a thin man to uh, a woman holding a baby. None of them could actually be William who was about six feet tall and very, as they said, doting and clumsy. So uh, this happened for a while. In fact, um, him and Madame Blavatsky started a psychical research uh, uh, in, in United States and he wrote a book called the people from the uh, another world, from the other world, which is uh, people from the other world is still in print. It's an amazing book on his accounts of these 10 weeks with the Eddies. Nobody, they tore the house apart. Nobody has ever been able to disprove anything that happened in that house. As each Eddie family member died, they would have on their grave, entered the world of spirits, passed into the world of spirits. The Eddie brothers died well into the 1900s. Um, so they were the last of the family to pass away. So they were they lived well into like 1922. And they, to this day, um, are still completely, nobody knows how they did this or what happened, but uh, they know one thing, it wasn't trickery. The Eddie House now is actually a ski lodge called the High Life Ski Lodge. It's in Chittenden, Vermont, and you can actually go see it. In our little area here in uh, Reading, Vermont, if anyone ever gets a chance to go to this Bailey's Mills bed and breakfast, uh, you can stay there. You will also be right in the front yard, as you can see, is a cemetery called Spite Cemetery. Now it's called Spite Cemetery because a man named Levi Bailey purchased a mill and a dam in 1794 and built that building you see. But in 1808, he wanted to expand the mill to across the road 
and he asked to purchase land from his next door neighbor, David Hapgood. Well, Hapgood could not stand Levi Bailey at all. So he refused him outright. Uh, and no matter how, what Levi Bailey proposed, he's like, no, I am not giving you an, an inch of this land. And Hapgood was much older than Bailey was. So one day Bailey yelled across the little road, you're much older than me, you're gonna die and I'm gonna have the land. Well, Hapgood was not about to be outdone. He donated the land as a cemetery. And when he died, he was the first one to be buried there in 1829. And you guessed it, looking right at Bailey's building. Well, this is a cemetery. Levi Bailey was not about to be outdone, uh, actually, because when he died, he was buried in the Spite Cemetery also. And basically, um, you can say he actually got some of the land he was looking for, although not in life. The Leatherman, uh, I don't know, many people have probably heard about the Leatherman. He was a famous a uh, roving vagabond in the uh, mid 1800s. He actually did a 360 mile cycle in Western Connecticut in Eastern New York state for over 30 something years, landing in the same place exactly, exactly 30 something days later. Okay, people could set their watch by him. From 1858 to 1889, he did this circuit. And he'd land 34 days, every 34 days from where he left a spot, he'd be right back there. He wore heavy leather clothing, shoes, and a hat made from scrap and had a backpack. He spoke little to no English. Um, he spoke some, some French and jested in communications of grunts and, and you know, waving and stuff. So uh, legends said who he may have been. One legend was he was a guy named Jules Borgley from France, who was to marry a, a socialite. And uh, the father of the socialite gave him a mission to prove his worth, where um, he was part of the trade uh, of his father's company. He invested in a lot of leather. The leather price dropped and he lost a ton of money, <clears throat> was thrown out of the company, never to marry, came to America and began this wandering. Nobody really knew who he was and nobody asked. Uh, he did <clears throat> stop by many homes. He never slept in the homes, but they would put food out for him. There was many caves and shelters that he actually slept in. He made beds out of bark and, and wood and he'd collect wood and put them in the cave to have a fire and had little gardens beside all these caves. But he never actually took uh, shelter in anyone's home. It became an honor to feed the wanderer. In fact, some schools would, the kid with the highest grade, the child with the highest grade, when the man arrived would be the one with the honor to give him his meal. And uh, if someone ever asked questions of who he was, he would never, ever, ever go back to that place. He was freezing to death in 1888 and he was captured, but he actually managed to escape from the hospital, which was kind of interesting. This was his circle he did, as you can see, from Briarcliff, Man in New York, to New Mill, to Bristol, to Middletown, Danbury, 365-mile cycle. Um, he, had, he gained mouth cancer in the last uh, year of his life, and he died on March 24th, 1889, in Sawmill Cave near Sing Sing. They buried him in a small grave in Sparta, New York, and that's when an Englishman <clears throat> named Samson Fisk King Bennett claimed that he was Jules Bogley of France, a friend of his and paid for his burial. Um, however, that became uh, just non-fact. Non in 2008, I think it was, attempts were made to exhume him and uh, test his DNA to see who he really was. Unfortunately, when they did exhume him, they found nothing but dust and uh, wooden pieces from the coffin. There was nothing they could use to test DNA. So they buried him further into the cemetery with a big stone rock with a plaque on it that says the Leatherman. And that was his, uh, this is one of the caves he, he lived in as you can see. And then in Easton, Connecticut, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, we have another man that was predated actually the leather man. He was called the darn man. 
And he was one of the most strange people that ever traveled these roads. From 1830 to 1863, he wandered the tri-state area of Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Another person who never ever gave his name, but the stories of his life did vary. He gave small clues um, because he was very well refined, very well dressed, actually did have some money. Um, he always wore a white wedding suit with a white top hat and he played the fiddle and he was very, um, just very well learned actually. Ellen Learned wrote a count about his travel. She was a famous writer of this area. And um, <clears throat> he actually, uh, played, he, like I said, he, carried, he, was, he used to stay at some families and um, he would read the, all their newspapers. He would take his tea, which was kind of great. He would take his tea um, and he would make it himself. He made a great tea, everyone loved it. He would actually sit down to dinner and stay in the people's houses, unlike Leatherman, and he would help out with chores. But the reason he was called Darn Man or Old Darn Coat was because whenever he stopped at one of these places that uh, he was gonna stay the night, the first thing he would ask for was yarn and a needle to repair any of the rips and rents in his clothing. And that's where he got the name Darn Man. Well, he once told a family he was George Johnson from Rhode Island. And um, he made a bunch of different things where he said, son to one person one time, don't ever uh, spend your money on a ring or a woman to before they surely leave you at the altar. They think that he was to marry. And for some reason, his bride never showed up. There's a few theories. One, she left with another person. Two, actually she had gone and taken a ferry to uh, Long Island to um, get a dress. And they think the ferry sank, which she was on the, one of the ferries that sank. So he was left at the altar. <clears throat> and three, uh, she just uh, got sick and Pat died somewhere else. But um, he just for this rest of his life did this circle. And one man said, Why, where do you live? Don't you have a home? And he once said, yes, anywhere the night overtakes me. Now, in, um, the, in the actual, uh, right here, here it is. Actual, in 1863, in the very cold, he was found by Elijah Anderson on the Connecticut, Rhode Island border near Snake Hill, uh, not Snake Hill Road, uh, Snake Meadow Road. He was, uh, by the time the guy took him home, he had already died. So they buried him on their property and no, on an unmarked grave and no one's been able to find it. I have looked and I have nothing that shows where he might be. However, they did find out one thing. And this is actually the property he was buried on. That's where he died on that road and uh, buried on the farmland just off to the right. He actually did think, found one thing somebody had, and they said his name was Addison Thompson, Moses Thompson, or Frank Howland of the Mayflower family. Most people think his name was actually Addison Thompson. So, but nobody really, really knows who Old Darn Coat was. Ace of Popcorn Snow, if anyone's ever been to the Quabbin Reservoir area, uh, gate, uh, what is it, gate 40 on Route 32? <clears throat> There is, uh, or to the right, there was an open field that used to be Asa Popcorn Snow's farm. Well, Asa Snow was a very strange, strange man. He is now buried in the Quappen Cemetery, as you can see with his, uh, fam with his family, yeah. Asa Popcorn Snow was born in Cape Cod and moved to Dana. His diet consisted mostly of milk and popcorn. His first wife hanged herself in 1844 and his daughter died a year later. Around 1860, he built a tomb, redug up their remains, and um, put it, uh, well, first of all, he put the, the remains of them in this tomb, but he also showed it, his wife to anyone interested. In other words, he built a coffin for her and showed the remains of his wife, and I don't know how many people would have been interested. He built a metal coffin, however, with a glass top constructed for himself, completely, uh, just completely airtight. And when he died, ironically, on November 29th in 1872, while dragging a pig carcass in for Thanksgiving guests. So this vegetarian died dragging meat in. Well, he was put into that 
coffin with the, his remains, his first wife and daughter were put on top of it, what was left of them. And he made a stipulation for uh, Undertaker to watch him for several days in case he woke up. That's what the glass top of the coffin was, so they could see him wake up. So uh, his second wife, though, relieved the Undertaker after three days. She paid him full price and said, ah, he's gone. Just let him. If he's not dead now, he you know, was before he is now. However, his body remained in perfect state for many, many decades. In fact, um, <clears throat> that news report came in 1912. Then uh, people would be dared to stay in the tomb. One guy was uh, gave it made a dare of, I think it was $25, which I guess was a lot in 1900, to spend the night in the tomb. And he did, almost. When his horse started freaking out and took off, he ran right behind the horse. The guy still paid him the bet. Uh, because of this tomb being right there and open in that area, where um, somebody broke the glass and they stole the skull of his first wife. Uh, when they broke the glass, he began to deteriorate quite rapidly. When the Quabbin Reservoir was put in, they took his remains and removed them to the Quabbin Cemetery. However, they say his ghost returns every November on his old farm looking for his wife's skull. If you're driving down <clears throat> 107 Cuttingsville, Vermont, you're going to see this man standing, looming <clears throat> right over the road. It is not a ghost. It is the likeness of John Porter Bowman. John Porter Bowman was a wealthy tanner and uh, made very, very big wealth, in fact. His daughter died, Addie, in 1854 <clears throat> at only age four months. His uh, wife, Ella, died. I mean, his do other daughter died in 1879 and his wife, Jenny, in 1880. He had built a beautiful home across the street from a little cemetery, and uh, this beautiful home uh, was their summer home. However, they did not get to enjoy it much. What he did is he had an elaborate mausoleum built. It took a, a lot of money, a lot of time, with the busts of him and his family in front of mirrors and marble floors and arches and sayings, and um, so you could see it from all sides, and a little mausoleum when you look inside with the mirrors it looks huge and amazingly huge then he had a statue of himself put outside the door oh sorry and that's the statue right there as you can see he's holding a key a wreath and a hat every year they open the mausoleum so you can look in and but every winter they cover that statue and um, the mansion across the street is still there. He lived there from 1887 until his death in 1891. It was kind of funny because he left a trust fund for the upkeep of the property to be exactly as it was when he died. And that servants were to make dinner each night and light the fireplaces and light the lamps for their return. So now ghost stories of the place being haunted are common. You can go visit Laurel Glen, that's the name of it, and Laurel Glen Mausoleum, and you can't miss it. it it's right on the road. But John Porter Bowman's likeness is there standing, waiting to for any visitors. <clears throat> and this one, XYZ. This is one of our favorite stories. That's an actual grave marker. XYZ. It's small, but it's there. In the Deep River Savings Bank on December 13, 1899, four men attempted a robbery. However, the bank had been warned that this was going to happen at some point, so they had hired a sharpshooter, Captain Harry Tyler, to watch the bank at night. Well, he was waiting, and when somebody broke the window to the bank, he fired a shot. He shot the man right through the eye, and the man died instantly. The other three fled. Nobody ever knew who they were. The man shot, however, was unknown. They took him, tried to find any kind of ID, but there was nothing on his person but safe cracking tools. So they buried him in Fountain Hill Cemetery near the back of train tracks, way in the back. All of a sudden, a letter arrives in a woman's handwriting that there is a, she said to have a little stone made, she would fund it, 
and have the letters X, Y, Z put on it. And that's what the townsfolk did. For the next 40 years, once a year, a woman in a long black veil would arrive by train at the station, walk back down the tracks to the back of the cemetery, put flowers on the grave and pray. Now, this was kind of interesting because um, if you ever heard the song Long Black Veil, which is an old country tune, it kind of reminds me of it. But in 1900s, somebody proposed that XYZ was the notorious robber and criminal Frank Howard. However, many people have disputed that, saying no, um, that wouldn't be him. And XYZ's identity will always remain a mystery because actually nobody ever confronted the strange woman who for that many decades used to arrive by train wearing a black veil, walk down to the cemetery and put these flowers on the grave. So who she was, was also a mystery as well as XYZ. If you get a chance to go to Lemonster, Mass, um, you may wanna visit a cemetery where this man's grave is. Yes, he was persecuted for wearing the beard. Joseph Palmer in the 1800, early 1800s decided he was gonna wear a long flowing beard. However, at this time of the 1800s, beards were thought to be sinful of the time. In fact, they were thought to be uh, totally against the religious people of the times, the Bible and everything. So this man who wore a beard down past his, uh, almost to his uh, stomach, now, uh, was openly insulted, pelted with rocks. And at one point he even was attacked with scissors in 1830 while leaving the old Fitchburg Hotel. Being a man of great size, he fought them off and actually stabbed one of the men uh, in the leg with a jackknife. Well, he was uh, jailed and brought to court and was he fined heavily for this riot he caused. He, repays the few, he refuses to pay the fine, spends 15 months in jail. He's got the money. He's got money. He just won't pay the fine because he was right. Well, the word got out across the nation that Fitchburg was doing this to some poor guy, and they looked really foolish and really stupid. So they said, let's just let him go. Well, they released him, but he would not leave until a proclamation was made where he could walk the streets without worry, wearing his long beard, which was basically against the church and many laws. Well, that never happened. So he wouldn't leave. He didn't leave jail. One day, they literally overpowered him, tied him to a chair, and threw him out into the street and literally locked him out of jail. <laughs> now, um, our, our Mr. Palmer was an avid abolitionist and temperance supporter, and he was famous for his beard. And actually, because of this incident, he made many famous friends, Emerson, Thoreau, Louisa May Alcott even used him for her character, Moses White, in her book, Transcendental Wild Oats. The funny thing is, he died October 30th, 1873, at age 84, at a time where about 10 years to 13 years before, beards came into vogue. So before the 1860s, you would really never see anyone with beards, ever. He was buried in the Evergreen Cemetery in Lemons de Mass in the front row facing the streets with his likeness and the epitaph, persecuted for wearing the beard. And you can go visit him anytime you want. Now, as from what I understand, Hiller family who lived in Wilmington, Wilmington is almost right next door to Tewksbury. Well, the Hillers it had a monumental idea at one point. He, um, they were married, both of them, Henry Hiller and Franz Hiller were physicians. And they became wealthy beyond. They had actually met in England. They came to America and they honeymooned at the Cape and traveled around and decided to settle in the sleepy little town of Wilmington around 1870. Well, they became very wealthy. Mr. Hiller invented an elixir that he would sell and prescribe at his uh, doctor's office down near Boston. So they did become very wealthy. They had 23 children, 14 were twins, 
unfortunately, all of them died very early in life. Being ardent spiritualists, and the spiritualist movement was huge at this time in America. Uh, it was an insanely huge. I mean, everybody was into it just about. They believed in the afterlife, and they believed that they could come back or that something would, you know, be, if they were comfortable, they'd be able to come back. Well, with this idea, they decided to hire a man, James McGregor, a famous woodcarver, to design and build these massive, elaborate sarcophaguses with inner boxes. When they gave the design and they went over it, he told them it would take at least three to three and a half years to finish each coffin. And they said, go right ahead. And they offered to give him $40 a day, which you've got to believe what. And um, in, uh, I guess, you know, the, the late 1800s, uh, it, that was a lot of money. At 1880s, yeah, it was about 1886. Well, anyway, each was, to, was supported by eight 17 inch tall brass lion's paws. They were to have ivory vines running along the outer edge, converging in the center with a large skull and a lizard coming out of one of its eye sockets. The sides, the top would be all adorned with angels and bats and cupids flying over serpents and dragons flanked with the sides everywhere and an owl holding a field mouse. Now, the, each one was made of mahogany with an inner box that held a steel hammock suspended from four corners. The top of the box had, would, had the gold and silver plaques with the names and portraits of the couple and their 23 children. Each one stood five, over five feet tall from the floor and weighed over a ton. So that was a pretty intense uh, you know, undertaking. Each casket in the end would cost $30,000. On November 7, 1888, Henry died from a fall at age 43. Just a few months before, one of his neighbors said, ah, Mr. Hiller, uh, is your casket ready? And he said, no, but I should think it will be in plenty of time for my funeral. Well, it wasn't. It was not finished until September 1889. What they did is they buried Mr. Hiller in a little temporary wall in the back of the house. Then when, he, uh, when the casket was finished, they had it brought there, they had a crane drop it, they had him put in it, and then they had it brought to a mausoleum that was unfinished. It was a 40 by 40 mausoleum, 40 feet tall by 40 feet wide and long, which had plate glass windows and brass rail uh, caging on the outside of the window uh, rails. So people could look inside and see these beautiful caskets that they would have. However, Frances did arrive three years later. She was still alive for it. And it was such a marvel to her that she displayed it in her living room. And when people came, she would actually don her burial gown, which had, gown, I mean, which had like a thousand yards of lace on it. And then she'd have her servants lower her into the casket to show people what she would look like at her funeral. In fact, she had a mirror put on the ceiling so she could see herself what she would look like when she was buried. Well, because of this wild and eccentric behavior, she became known as the casket lady. Because at one point, she had the casket brought to Boston and exhibited in the horticultural hall for all to see. Well, when it came back, um, she had a wax figure with the burial ground made and put in the casket. That way she wouldn't have to keep having herself lowered and raised into it. But five years later, all the friends and people in town that she'd like to knew, they got a wedding invitation that she would be being married to Mr. Henry Hiller. Now this is pretty wild because Mr. Henry Hiller was dead. But it soon came to light that her coachman, Peter Surrett, had wooed her and she fell in love with him and she agreed to marry him on April 2nd, 1893, if he legally changed his name to Henry Hiller. Well, he did. They lived happily for seven years, but France died on May 18, 1900 at the age of 56. And the funeral was an amazing affair. I, everybody turned out in town. There was thousands of people. The streets were lined as 
she would load it into her coffin and brought onto the, uh, you know, the, the, the truck and which almost buckled from the weight of the coffin. And then the horse drawn wagon started bringing her and then they had to stop because she had this giant awning on the wagon. Uh, it was 19 feet tall. It started hitting the trolley lines. So they called carpenters in to cut 14 inches off of this uh, big canopy. And then they were able to continue on to the cemetery. Well, they had the 10 strongest men they could find to lift the casket off the truck. And uh, then it was put on a crane and then it was put on the veranda of where they would do the, you know, this, this funeral ceremony, but that buckled and everybody had to come running over and lift the casket and move it. Well, she was put into the unfinished mausoleum and yes, People did go see it, but a strange thing in 1935, the mausoleum was falling apart. It was leaking. Uh, nobody was going to build it because there was no more hillers. <clears throat> so the second Henry decided the only thing he could do was have it raised and bury the coffins. Well, after he lived another 58 years and what they did is they buried the coffins and they brought in two small uh, I guess marble or cement urns to mark their graves. So these monumental, unbelievable works of art sit under the ground when no one will ever see them. Now you can see in this picture, that's a pretty big coffin. <laughs> Look at the truck next to it. And uh, I swear you could probably almost put the pickup truck next to it into the coffin. So unfortunately there, um, eternal, uh, you know, coffins weren't to be seen eternally. However, we do have another man <clears throat> who did <clears throat> take it with him, literally. Mr. Lucas Douglas. Mr. Lucas Douglas actually died in 1895 alone, penniless, unmarried, and very few relatives. When they were ready to bury him, this is in Ashford, Connecticut which is Eastern Connecticut. When they were ready to bury him in a pauper's grave in the, in the Westwood Cemetery, which was a local cemetery, they found a will. Well, this will stated that he was to be buried with a 34 foot tall Italian monument, a 140 foot stone marble fence with large urns adorning each corner in the walkway. However, the walkway also was 40 feet long to be flanked by a row of hedges. And that's what came. The monument had a likeness of him and below it was inscribed, Lucas Douglas, born October 28, 1823, died you know, December 5th, 1895, at 72 years. Another side carved into it is be faithful unto death. And then the lower section reads, found dead, dead and alone on a pillow of snow in a roofless street. Nobody heard his last faint moan or knew when his last heart be, ceased to beat. Another epitaph, as you can see, though in that I, uh, paths of death I tread with gloomy horrors overspread, my steadfast heart shall fear no ill. For thou, O Lord, art with me still. Thy friendly crook shall give me aid and guide me through the dreadful shade. Now, these were except, probably except for the one, the found dead one, um, was all preordained and pre-cut. I guess the, that one would be put in after he was dead for whatever, wherever. And anyway, the other sayings I've heard that I call, death is but a gentle slumber. The Alpha Omega symbol in 1896 twined and, and just interlined with this 30 foot high Italian marble stone for the man who died penniless, but had a grave fit for a king. If you go to the Westford Cemetery, um, you will see this uh, giant, you can't miss it. It's a very small cemetery. I think this takes up a third of it. But that's a big monument. And you can also see where his um, likeness is right there in, in, uh, into the monument. And there's some of the stuff. So it was very, um, it cost over $200,000 for this. Now, in 1895, that's a pretty penny. Helen Dow Peck's amazing will. <clears throat> um, the Ouija board 
from 1891 right through, I guess, till the time the uh, Exorcist came out, was almost in every household. In fact, 40 million of them have sold, and uh, almost everybody used them, especially during the times of the Depressions and the World Wars and the Korean War. And um, uh, during the spiritualist movement, forget it. It was big. In fact, uh, Saturday Evening Post, it was a cover with two people playing a Ouija board. Well, Helen Dow Peck was one person who used the Ouija board, but she died in Danbury, Connecticut in 1959, and she was pretty wealthy. She left her two servants, $1,000 each, and John Gale Forbes, $178,000, the balance of her, her estate. She and her husband, Frank, had contacted Forbes in 1919 and had stayed in contact with Forbes until her death in 1955, but only seeing him once in 1940. <clears throat> the bizarre thing about this is how she knew the man. Her and her husband had contacted Forbes through a Ouija board. And they had remained in contact with this Ouija board sessions with Forbes. She had seen him in 1940. Oh, yes, he said his spirit had appeared to him. Well, the family contested the will. The bank searched for the first for this person saying he could exist, but nothing ever, ever surfaced. Peck believed he may have actually existed and was living in a mental institution using psychic ability to speak with her. So she set up a trust for psychiatric research of, for mental patients should he or his family ever surface. Well, no John Gale Forbes ever existed, except for once again, when he supposedly appeared to her in 1940. In 1958, they decided that there was no such thing as John Gale Forbes and that the family won the case and the money. Very interesting. Uh, let me do something here. Ah, Rebecca Cornell. I want to talk about this one. One of the only times in American history, and of course it happens in New England, where a ghost solved their own murder. Rebecca Cornell, on February 8, 1673, was found burned by fire in her room. Guests and lodgers were present. Thomas Cornell, her son, had been the last in the room with her and said, Mother won't be coming out for dinner tonight. She hates salted mackerel. That's what they were having for dinner. Well, anyway, um, about a two or three hours later, uh, they send the grandson in to see if she wanted boiled milk, and they find this heap on the floor smoking. They walk in and the first thing they find is that the bed linens had been burned and put out, but that Rebecca Cornell had burned to death. Well, I mean, I don't think if she was running around in flames, she'd be putting out bed linens, but anyway, they bury her. A few nights later, her brother, John Briggs, wakes up to this bright light in his room and it's Rebecca. And she says, see how badly I'm burning. She opens up her frock and she exposes a stab wound. Well, the body is exhumed and examined, and yes, there is a wound. Thomas is arrested. The trial is actually in the Portsmouth archives. Um, there's many, many testimony and, and people that are saying, well, Rebecca wanted to move to Philadelphia because uh, Thomas was threatening her. They wouldn't give her sufficient blankets. Um, you know, and, and uh, they didn't pay the rent. They, Thomas was a no, near, you know, no, near well-to-do person or whatever. And um, so all this testimony dooms Thomas. He's found guilty of his mother's murder and executed on May 23rd, 1673 at 1 p.m. in Newport. He wanted to be buried next to his mother. However, um, they said no. They buried him somewhere between the house and the road on their property. The Cornell grave site is behind the former property, but uh, Thomas Cornell's wife was pregnant at the time, and she married in, I mean, she um, gave birth to a girl who she called Innocent Cornell in protest of Thomas's innocence. Well, Innocent Cornell grew up and married. Richard Borden in 1691. She would become the great, great, great grandmother of Lizzie Borden. So 
Does it run in the family? In Cavendish, Vermont, Phineas Gage stunned the medical field around the world when he actually lived after a tragic accident. He was a blasting foreman for the Rutland and Burlington Railroad. And what they, he would do is they would put an explosive charge into a rock after they drilled a hole, then they would put dirt there and then they would tamp the gunpowder really tight and then light a wick and run. Well, uh, he had his own custom made three foot tamping rods. What happened was he was distracted for a second, look away while tamping and the rock and the iron hit and caused a spark. And this one and a quarter inch diameter rod through blew through his upper jaw, left eye, brain and skull landing 80 feet away. Believe it or not, Phineas Gage walked back to town with help and approached Dr. William, I mean, Edward Williams. And he said, doctor, here is business enough for you. Him and another physician removed bone fragments and an ounce of brain. But three months later, Phineas was home in Lebanon. He became a worldwide attraction, believe it or not. He toured with his famous tamping iron, um, having his left eye gone and showed the hole in his skull and everything like that. And so you know, people would go flock to theaters where he'd sit there and tell his story with his tamping iron. He moved west and he died on May 21st, 1860, at only 36 years old, about 12 years after the accident, um, from epileptic seizures he was having after the accident. He was buried in San Francisco's Lone Mountain Cemetery. In 1866, his skull and tamping iron were disinterred and given to Dr. Hollow, the man who had taken care of him after the accident. In 1940, his remains were moved to Cypress Lawn Cemetery in San Francisco. Later though, the skull and the tamping iron were given to Harvard Med School's Warren Anatomical Museum. They are still on display to this day as one of the people who defied medical science living with half his brain taken out of his head. New England's only stigmati. I think this is the last one, I'm not sure, but if you want, you know. <clears throat> stigmati, uh, stigmata is a sign of the passions of Christ when uh, he was crucified. The hands bleed profusely, the feet bleed, um, where he wore, wore the thorn of crowns, the head bleeds, and even where he was stabbed in the side bleeds. That's five different signs of, of stigmati, uh, stigmata. And uh, Marie Rose Ferrin was New England's only stigmati. She was born in 1902, believe it or not, in a stable in Quebec, Canada. She was one of 15 children, the family being very, very, very religious. Uh, the mother was, gave each one the mystery of the rosary. Marie was the 10th, incidentally, and the 10th is crucifixion. When she was 23, they moved to Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And uh, she, at that point, was suffering from crippling arthritis at only 23. But she claimed St. Anthony helped her find lost items. Her father, to see if it was true one day on the way home from work, hid his work shoes somewhere behind the railroad tracks and asked her if she could find them for him. Well, she got on her crutches and she walked around the house right out the door right down to the railroad tracks and pulled them out. Uh, her She actually um, healed people. She would ha have holy water and uh, she would actually bless it and she would heal people. In fact, her sister had a stroke one time. Her sister was not married and had a couple of kids and was working and she touched her and she said, you'll be better. Well, uh, the sister came back and was completely healed, but um, in her left arm, but Marie Rose's, or Little Rose as they called her, was lame. And she said, I don't need it anyway. By age 23, she became mostly bedridden. In age 20, I mean, in 1926, the stigmata began. The wounds started appearing regularly in 1927. They would open and large quantities of blood would flow from them. Uh, and, but then the next morning, you would, they would only see pink wounds. In other words, the wounds would not be there anymore, just pink scars. She 
predicted her own death. She said that she was going to die the same age as Christ. And she died of natural causes on May 11th, 1936, at 33 years of age, the same age Christ supposedly died. Uh, she was denied sainthood, uh, despite the evidence of her being buried with these signs of the stigmata. Uh, but people still flock to her grave constantly, still flock to her grave to, in Woonsocket's Precious Blood Cemetery to uh, be healed, to just be, you know, uh, pray over it and everything. I think the last one we're going to have here is Captain Thunderbolt. Now, does anyone know, I'm sure you know what highwaymen were. They were prominent 17, 1800s. Um, however, by the mid 1800s, there was no such thing anymore. Well, uh, they were prominent in America, Canada, England, Scotland, Ireland, you know, everywhere. Uh, Michael Martin, which was Captain uh, Lightfoot and Captain Thunderbolt were the two most famous highwaymen in history. However, Captain Thunderbolt was hanged in uh, Scotland or Ireland in, in uh, 1920, I mean, 1821. Michael Martin, Captain Lightfoot, migrated here to America and New England and um, Canada did his hijinks till he was caught in Medford, Mass, arrested, and hanged in uh, 1822. Now, a man named John Wilson moves to Brattleboro, Vermont. In 1822, he takes over a medical practice and he's liked by everybody, respected by his peers. Um, he's a brilliant man, a good businessman, and, but he never had any documents to prove of his, well, education. He just said he had taken it in Edinburgh, Scotland, and in some in other Vermont medical schools. And he was, he was actually a school teacher also. He designed and built the famous round schoolhouse in Brookline, Vermont. Well, he died on March 22nd in 1847, age 58 of an acute erysipelas, a form of cellulitis. And during his illness, he said if he had died, he wanted to be buried fully clothed, no autopsy needed, no nothing, just bury me the way you see me. Well, somebody didn't get the message because they started preparing his body for burial. They took his clothes off and some wild things came to light. He had rope burns on his neck, which would explain why he wore a scarf or a cravat 24 seven in front of people, even in the hottest days of summer. He had a wound resembling a musket shot removed by primitive surgery from his leg and a portion of his heel was missing where he had cork put in his shoes to make it so he wouldn't limp much. Also, his leg was withered and he used, a, a, there was stuffing in his pants, wadding to make it look as if it was as big as the other leg. Subsequent research revealed that he had been no, none other than Captain Thunderbolt, the famous highwayman thought to have been hanged in Scotland in 1820. His partner, Michael Martin, had written a giant memoir before his death, a confession, saying all of his exploits and everything that happened with he and Captain Thunderbolt. Well, every single thing that happened uh, that he talks about with Captain Thunderbolt, this guy, John Wilson, had. The shot being taken out of his leg by himself, having his heel blown off, his leg withering, and of course being hanged. Well, you know, uh, as I said, uh, um, Michael Martin hung in 1821. They searched his home, and when they searched Captain Thunderbolt's home, they found sword canes, pistols, um, all kinds of other weaponry, uh, swords, rifles, and even a few other trick ones that, uh, like a, a cane that when you click it, it made the sound like it was a gun being loaded. Well, there was no doubt we had uh, one of the more, more famous educators in Vermont and doctors was none other than one of the last and most famous highwaymen. He's buried under the name John Wilson, however, in Prospect Hill Cemetery. So you can go see his grave. It's way in the back to the left. Captain Thunderbolt, that's his grave. And you can see there's a picture of him uh, <clears throat> where he, uh, they found out who he was. Quite amazing. I'm going to skip Jonathan Moulton. Uh, um, Anyway, any questions, anybody?
I'd love to hear it and I hope you enjoyed it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tom. We'll take uh, at least five minutes of questions. Uh, okay. We did, we did start about five minutes late. Mostly uh, Megan, all of these come from this book, our latest book, Strange New England, so they can get that anywhere. <laughs> oh, there you go. Plug the book, Tom. Plug the book. Uh, so Megan says, thank you. Uh, really fun and interesting. Uh, Gail says, thank you. Karen says, this was excellent. Uh, so Tracy has a question. Uh, given that he, he was penniless, uh, who paid for Lucas Douglas's memorial? Do you happen to know, Tom? Yes, he was penniless because he had saved his money and put it all away in a trust fund for himself and his will, which when he died, the bank actually brought forth and said, well, this is what he's got and this is where it's going. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Sharon says, thank you. This was very interesting. Dolores says, thank you as well. Uh, Margaret asks, um, she did not get the town name of XYZ. What, what was the town there? Oh, I'm sorry. It's Deep River, Essex, Connecticut. It's down Southern Connecticut, somewhere about the middle of the state. Deep River. Excellent. Uh, Raylene also says, thank you. So folks, last call for questions. Tom, I wanted to ask you a question, semi-unrelated, but uh, mm -hmm. last time you spoke here in Tewksbury, you discussed your uh, history of New England um, vampire books. Um, I think I messed that up. The history yeah. of vampires in New England book. <laughs> and um, I'm just curious, uh, do you happen to be a fan of the television series, American Horror Story? I was, yeah. Um, we don't have time to watch it anymore, but I thought that was a really cool and inventive well, I, I know I know this is your busy season, and I won't give yeah. away any spoilers, but I suggest you watch the new season because the first six episodes deal with uh, vampires uh, in Provincetown. Oh, cool! So I think I think uh, you'd like it. In, the, um, in this in this new book, not to uh, just to say quickly, we do have the vampire story of JB fifty five, the one that they actually found actual proof of a vampire and they found through DNA, they know his name, John Barber. Excellent, excellent. And Tom, people can purchase that book on uh, Amazon or their independent bookstores or- Barnes uh, and Noble. They can even contact right. us to buy it, purchase it. And we, we, we sell it for the same price, uh, free shipping, and we personalize it the way they want. There you go. Uh, Brian says, I've read a few of your books. Tom and I uh, really enjoyed the New Hampshire one. Uh, thank you for doing this tonight. It was very interesting. Uh, Angela uh, is uh, uh, yes to Red Tide, she says. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, so let's see. Shay says, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Bernie says, uh, how did you become so interested in the paranormal? I grew up in a haunted house. And then in college, I actually stayed in one that was very, very, very haunted. Okay. Uh, John says, uh, thank you, Tom. Will you be at any Paracons in the near future? Actually, um, we're doing one in uh, Kittery next year. There's a, there's a Kittery Paracon by Essex um, County Paranormal. And uh, it's being held in Kittery. You can look it up. Uh, Brian, well, I'll ask this question. Brian is curious uh, if, you, if you attended college and what college did you attend? I attended Rhode Island College and I graduated with a degree in political science and a minor in music and business management. And that's where I also studied all kinds of different sciences to approach the paranormal, social sciences, um, uh, esoterical sciences, uh, you know, astrology, astronomy, even meteorology, psychology, sociology, all kinds of different sciences to, uh, so I would, try to at least better understand what this is all about. So Tom, I'm curious as a librarian, uh, how do you uh, conduct the research for your books and do you ever consult libraries? Yes, libraries actually are the greatest free resource this country has. Yeah, I, I go to consult libraries like crazy. And I look, I also have a library of my own in my house of over 2000 books on New England, history, towns, legends, folklore, everything. And uh, so, yeah, archive.org, uh, libraries, um, history books, people, place, we just go to places, town halls are great also. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Uh, Cheryl says, thank you. Uh, sorry I was late. It was very interesting. And the last question slash comment goes to Bernie. Uh, I love to hear about your personal experiences growing up in a, in a haunted house. You, you want to share just one or two of those, Tom? Yeah, sure. Um, in our house, um, we had many things happen over the years. Some things like uh, we'd be sitting there and all of a sudden, like my, my little brother wouldn't be upstairs. He might be downstairs. And on his bed, you'd see stuffed animals. And all of a sudden, you'd hear the squeaking. And it looked like someone was walking across the bed with the stuffed animals falling like you would if you were walking across a mattress. Uh, we've, we've actually I've seen apparitions. And uh, doors would open by themselves. Uh, in the in the other house I stayed in, uh, the actual we actually saw an apparition. We had something come bolting up the stairs while we were standing at the top of the stairs, and all that passed us was a wind. So there's some you know there's some pretty uh, convincing things. I, I look at it more as a science than a, a very untapped science at that. Excellent. And um, Joy says, thank you. She loved the extra facts that you provide. Uh, so why don't we wrap it there, Tom? And uh, Tom, do you have any last words before we uh, end the program? Um, yeah, uh, thank you, everybody. I, I really appreciate it and sharing all these really cool stories with you. And they, if you want to, we have events called Dining with the Dead 1031, which is actual interactive paranormal investigation dinners that we hold where you are the investigator. Uh, we have dinner, we break into groups, we show you how to use the equipment and you invest in mo investigate the most haunted places with us. And it's called Dining with the Dead 1031, just like Halloween. You can go online and find it. All right, well, I wanna thank the libraries in Boxford, Clinton, Drake, at Littleton, Lowell, Merrimack, Newbury, Norwood, uh, and Tewksbury for uh, uh, promoting tonight's program. Tom, great job as usual. We'll have you back uh, next you so year, much. I'm sure, uh, for, for our Fright Night series. Uh, I hope, I encourage folks to visit uh, TewksburyPL.org um, or uh, you know, if you're uh, living in a, another community, uh, certainly uh, visit your library's uh, website. And uh, I encourage you to attend uh, some of the upcoming programs. So thank you so much, Tom. Thank you all for thank joining you. us. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. <laughs> Bye, Tom. Bye. Thank you.